It's a real honor to be here speaking with you today. Uh, unsurprisingly, my talk is about transportation. Uh, and when you're traveling, it's helpful to know not just where you're going, but where you are and how you got there. So I'm going to start with a drive down memory lane, uh, detouring only slightly to talk about what we're doing down in Eugene, and then accelerate into a discussion of convergent future technologies that can get us to that destination. Put simply, as a culture, we must move to a sustainable transportation system. When we're talking about electric cars, when we're talking about radically increased vehicle efficiency, what we're really talking about is sustainability. A sustainable system is one that doesn't crater over time. And the system that we live with today is on a terribly unsustainable trajectory that we persist with at our great peril. So how do we get here? Let's rewind back to the beginning, which in this case is 1900, the dawn of the internal combustion age. You could tap some ground in Texas, a bunch of oil geysers out. It's cheaper than dirt, and there was no awareness at all of the external effects of just torching all of that energy. There were no cars on the road. Cars were very expensive. If you could even afford a car at all, it had to perform many functions, from carrying the family to pulling the plow to taking goods to market. But Ford's pioneering of mass production in combination with General Motors' creation of the first nationwide consumer credit bureau in 1919 made cars affordable, and adoption skyrocketed. So in 1919, there were something like 6.7 million cars on the road, but within just a decade, that had quadrupled to 27 million. The car promised freedom. It could carry the full family for hundreds of miles on a seemingly inexhaustible supply of domestically produced energy. And manufacturers started to differentiate, not just on basic product capabilities, but on branding and styling, uh, advertising methodology. And as the automobile ascended, mass transit declined. So in the early part of the 20th century, almost every major American city had a robust electrified rail network to very efficiently move people around. But by the 1950s, almost all of those networks were in serious decline. Tracks paved over and trains scrapped. By 1970, there were more than 100 million passenger cars on the road in America. And the negative effects of this transportation mode were starting to become clear. So whether you're talking about smog or sprawl or just simply dedicating more and more and more of our, of our urban environment to asphalt. As well, uh, where once we had produced all of our transportation energy domestically, by the 1970s, domestic oil production had peaked and begun to decline, and our excess demand had to be made up for in the global marketplace. Despite the brief focus on efficiency that was brought about by the OPEC oil embargo in 1973, the American trend towards oversized, inefficient vehicles continued, culminating with the invention of the sport utility vehicle. So, <laughs> despite the fact that the common vehicle usage pattern is one or two people traveling a relatively short distance with a relatively small amount of stuff, the typical tool for the job that we use is four to 5,000 pounds of steel powered by gasoline, which brings us to the present day. The peaking of domestic oil production in the 1970s was a foreshadowing of the peaking of global oil production in the last decade. And though production has peaked and even now begins to decline, demand has not. Emerging economies like China and India are coming online as major fossil fuel consumers, and despite our, our somewhat anemic economic recovery, the price of a barrel of oil and the price of gasoline are nearing once again all-time highs. Equally distressing, the geopolitical and environmental consequences of our continued reliance on fossil fuel are becoming harder and harder to ignore. Whether we're talking about rising temperatures and sea levels, erratic weather patterns, to catastrophic spills brought about by negligence, as well as the increasing difficulty of getting to our remaining reserves. Our sprawl-happy, pave-the-earth mode of transportation development has yielded now more than 45 million miles of roads worldwide. That's almost half the distance from the Earth to the Sun. And even just maintaining that infrastructure is putting increasing strain on already strapped public financing because we don't just push our vehicles down the road with oil, we actually pave the road with it too. So what's needed is clearly a radically more efficient solution. If only someone had invented a device, a sustainable transportation device, perhaps something to more efficiently solve that everyday vehicle usage pattern. And in fact, somebody did invent that device more than 100 years ago. It's called a bicycle. It's the most efficient form of transportation humanity has ever invented. Powered by burritos, direct drive, full environmental engagement. But un 
unfortunately, this incredibly fine invention doesn't actually serve as a solution to the sustainable transportation problem in as much as it hasn't solved it. In spite of the existence of this phenomenal construction, people still drive huge polluting vehicles even to solve very simple tasks. But while it might not be the replacement for the car, perhaps the bicycle can point the way to the automobile's next evolution. The World English Dictionary defines a car as a road vehicle, typically with four wheels, powered by an internal combustion engine. The push for transportation electrification challenges the second part of that highlighted segment, that is, the move to a radically more efficient drivetrain. Something like three times the energy efficiency of a gas-powered engine, the electric motor is quiet, it's clean, you've got instant torque, and it can be powered by renewable sources of energy. So this is like the mother of all transportation no-brainers, and after 100 years of false starts, it's finally beginning to gain traction. But as important as the drivetrain is the basic vehicle platform itself. Because when you take batteries and an electric motor and you put them inside a full-size automotive platform, the math doesn't work out. You end up with a product that costs too much that doesn't do enough. And so, like the bicycle, today's full-size electric car is a solution only for a narrow band of the population and thus not a solution for sustainable transportation generally. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, my, my background is actually computer games, so I approached the transportation space initially as a consumer. I sold a company in 2007 and went looking for a clean vehicle. My requirements were actually pretty simple. It needed to be electric, it needed to solve my daily transportation needs, and it needed to be adoptable. I wanted something that if I adopted it, everybody could adopt it. So I started scouring the internet for months, and for months my search came up empty until I saw this in the Eugene Celebration Parade. The buggy, uh, designed and sold as a kit by Oregon electric vehicle futurist Mark Murphy, proved that a small form hybridization that landed in between the bicycle and the car was actually possible. So I ordered a kit, I cajoled some friends into helping me put it together, and after a couple of months, started over from a clean sheet and incorporated a new company uh, to build an everyday electric vehicle. So my, my experience in product development has all been games, and I thought, well, why not take a game development approach to a vehicle? Extraordinary games don't actually start out that way. Games become extraordinary through a painstaking process of iteration and refinement, fine-tuning, and debugging. So our plan initially called for seven iteration steps from inception to market, and I'll, I'll go through those real quick. First, the basic vision of the product family something that was fun and useful for everyday trips. Then we established a footprint on the road that was more efficient than cars, but still stable and very capable. With that footprint established, we built our first concept car and used it to launch a new brand into public awareness. And then finally, we went back to school and engineered a new front-wheel drive electric vehicle platform that has winning characteristics for both ride and for efficiency. The next step was to just sort of take all of the best ideas of those first four generations and turn them into an actual product. And that was our fifth generation, the SRK, which we launched about a year ago. So the SRK was, was important mostly because it provided the blueprint for our actual product family. But it was still pretty far from something that we actually wanted to make copies of. So for the last 12 months, the team has been painstakingly iterating over basically every aspect of the vehicle, making it more efficient, making it lower cost, making it safer, uh, making it more capable. And so as of just yesterday, our Generation 6 Mule is on wheels for the very first time. Uh, it's a major step for us. Uh, because it represents our transition from uh, this sort of prototyping iteration stage into a vehicle production venture. Uh, but before we do that, we've got to put a body on it. So we've designed our own uh, vehicle body in-house, but this is actually the stage at which we want to open the platform to the broader worldwide design community. This is what we're going to build for our pilots, but we intend to do a design contest both for our vehicles and then for licensed other OEMs. So next up is the pilot fleet. The pilots are all it's just a select crew of early adopters that have a passion for saving the planet and have contacted us about being first in line. <laughs> and then we'll get good data from them, we'll get good on-road experience in preparation for Generation 7, which is 
production. So we intend to leverage the advanced uh, manufacturing capabilities as well as heavy vehicle expertise here in Oregon for the West Coast market, and then as we prove out the product on the road, partner with other manufacturers all over the world to bring it out in other markets as well. Meanwhile, mass transit, which for many decades has been in dysfunction and disrepair, is making a big comeback. And Portland's Max and Streetcar are shining examples of this trend. Some futurists even point to personal rapid transportation systems, magnetically levitated personal pod vehicles on rails as solutions for sustainable transportation. The challenge with both trains and with PRT is that they have a very high infrastructure cost. So if we're going to count on these systems to solve the sustainable transportation problem, we're going to be waiting for a long time. And at the same time, America's decades-long uh, so-called love affair with the automobile is beginning to lose its shine. As people become more aware of the negative effects of, the, of our current transportation paradigm, the idea of this car as an extension of persona has begun to wane, and that trend is accelerated by the adoption of vehicle sharing services like Zipcar. So Zipcar is super cool. Rather than having to own an SUV to go skiing and a Prius to drive to Seattle and a pickup truck to get a yard of dirt, you can use the right vehicular tool for the job, available, conveniently parked all throughout the city. Zipcar's challenge is that they actually have to own and maintain and park and, and, and deal with all of those vehicles in the fleet. The, the newer uh, vehicle sharing services that are really exciting are services like GetAround. So GetAround, rather than them owning the vehicles, they provide a system that efficiently lets you share vehicles with each other. They provide a profit motive for you to share the most expensive, fastest depreciating asset that you never actually use. With the touch of a button on the phone, you can reserve somebody else's car, and the owner can rest easy, knowing that they're fully insured while you do. But as cool as Get Around is, it pales in comparison to what's next. What's next is a technology that I've been dreaming about for more than a decade, and it's almost ready. This technology, in combination with ultra-efficient electric vehicle platforms and the next generation of mobile applications, will move us swiftly to a sustainable transportation system and disrupt transportation as we know it. In the United States, driver distraction causes about 30,000 plus deaths every year. It's about a million people worldwide. The Google self-driving car project tries to fix this. The concept is utterly simple. You get into your car, you tell it where you want to go, and it just gets you there. And you are free to do something else. To make this technology happen, we develop a complete new way of making cars smart. We equip them with lasers and cameras and radars to fully understand the situation around them and make careful calculations what to do next so as to drive just like a human driver. The car is smart enough to blend in just like a human being and it's been accident free. So, imagine a fleet of ultra-efficient, electric, self-driving vehicles cruising around the city, available at the touch of a button on your phone. You could be too young, you could be too old, you could be too drunk to drive, no problem. You could have a critical text message, Facebook status update, or tweet that absolutely must go out right now in the middle of rush hour traffic, no problem. It will be a personal rapid transportation system that uses the infrastructure that we already have, which means it can be adopted incrementally, at low cost, and as it proves out on the road, really cool stuff starts to happen. These autonomous vehicles can communicate with each other, which means that in a traffic jam situation, rather than getting that kind of accordion effect as vehicles catch up and accelerate, these vehicles will accelerate and brake together, making much better use of our existing asphalt assets. It'll also make our trains better. So existing mass transit becomes much better as soon as you have a last mile solution. Imagine, vehicle pulls up at your house, drops you off just as the train is getting there. On the other side, vehicle with your name on it takes you to your actual destination. And bicycling becomes much better because after all, the biggest barrier to adoption of the bicycle is that you've got to share the road with a distracted texting driver piloting a multi-ton vehicle right next to you. Our, 
the, the autonomous vehicle network will make radically better use of asphalt, smaller and fewer lanes, even for much more traffic, and a significantly reduced amount of parking requirements. So we'll be able to translate our parking lots into parks, reclaiming huge amounts of our urban landscape for more productive purposes. So, for all of the very grave challenges that we face in today's transportation landscape, we're on the cusp of some of the coolest things the world of vehicles has ever seen. Thank you.